Now, our next session is, is a keynote address from a, a CEO. During the course of today, we've been discussing many transitions, um, but the one which is on everybody's mind and is part of our long-term future is the transition to a low-carbon future. And that's what we're going to be hearing about now. So I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Jane Collin, who is the editor of World Gas Intelligence at Energy Intelligence. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Well, to paraphrase what many of you probably heard um, IEA Chief Fatih Birol say earlier today, there's no escape for the oil and gas industry from the impact of climate policies, either direct or indirect. That prompts the big question as to how the world's existing oil and gas giants plan to surf the transition to this lower carbon world. Basically, the extent to which they will respond to the climate challenge, will they make, make big changes, or essentially will they stick to their core business, particularly with oil and gas demand except, expected to keep growing for the foreseeable future. Within the industry, Norway Statoil has been among the in most enthusiastic backers of the landmark Paris Climate Accord, which is due to come into force early next month. And in fact, Statoil last year won our well, Energy Intelligence's Award for Leadership in New Energy, an award which this year is going to French Total. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome here today Elder Cetra, Statoil's President and Chief Executive, to explain in our second keynote speech of the afternoon why the industry, far from standing back passively, should actively help shape the transition to this low carbon future. Thank you, it's all yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Jane. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's really good to be here today having this opportunity to address uh, such an impressive and uh, you know, distinguished audience. Ladies and gentlemen, in just over two weeks, on the 4th of November, the Paris Agreement will enter into force. This is very good news and unprecedented action by the international community. It is a clear call to action. The transition to a low carbon future will be the biggest shift our modern day energy system has ever faced. Technology, policy and changing consumer behavior are transforming the energy landscape and will transform the oil and gas industry as well. All the way from how we access and how we produce our resources to the impact on the demand for our products. We face new realities and new expectations, but also new opportunities. So in this transition, we must do more than just react and adapt. We must lead the way as an industry. Today, I would like to offer some comments on the prospects for the oil and gas industry heading towards a low carbon future. I have three perspectives that I would like to share with you. The outlook for upstream activities, the rise of renewables, and the need for collaboration. Starting with uh, the upstream. So let's consider for a moment what the energy mix might look like in 2040. Stadol has recently developed three future energy scenarios. The renewal scenario takes a closer look at what it would take to reduce energy related emissions in line with the ambitions of the Paris Climate Agreement. Unsurprisingly, it turns out that the amount of coal in the energy mix will have to be reduced significantly, by around 50%. At the same time, new forms of renewable energy will have to grow significantly, accounting for around 15% of uh, the primary energy demand, which is up from slightly below 2% today. 
Many people express wishful thinking that we could go even further and remove, in fact, oil and gas from the equation altogether, just like that. But the energy realities tells us a very, very different story. It is simply impossible to imagine a world without oil and gas as important fuels during this transition, especially if we succeed in displacing coal. So I am proud to call myself an oil and gas man, executive. I've been in this industry for 36 years now, and I know how important the energy we produce is to people's daily lives. Oil and gas accounts for more than half of the world's energy use. We power the global economy and economic growth. And we also know that without including our industry in solving the challenge, it will not be possible to reach the climate goals, not in the short term and definitely not in the longer term. So as an industry, we need to show that we are part of the long-term solution. One of the most effective ways of cutting carbon emissions is by replacing coal with natural gas. We know that. The US case offers solid evidence that it works and that it actually works now. Replacing coal with gas has helped reduce emissions from the US power sector by approximately 12% over the last 10 years. The rest of the world, including Europe, cannot afford to ignore this fact and such impacts. Indeed, in any of the 2040 scenarios that we have looked at, production from existing reserves is not even close to keeping up with the demand. And this means that there is a continued and a significant need for more exploration and new investments in both oil and gas. It also means that how the way we run our operations matters a lot to climate, simply because of the scale of our activities. I'm convinced that a low carbon footprint will increasingly be a competitive advantage in our industry as tighter regulations and additional increasing cost of emissions comes into place. One example is what Stado and the industry is doing on the Norwegian continental shelf. Already a world leader in carbon efficient oil and gas production. And now we are setting the bar even higher. The oil and gas industry in Norway will jointly reduce CO2 emissions by an additional 2.5 million tons by 2030, on top of previous commitments. And this step up alone equates to the emissions from seven out of 10 cars on Norwegian roads. My second point is about the rapid growth of renewable energy. In 2015, a record 330 billion US dollar was invested into renewable energy, half of the amount that went into upstream. Over 90% of electricity generated last year was renewable, 90%. Wind power accounted for approximately half of that. So many think that renewables are expensive and require costly subsidies. And they still do in most cases. But technology and innovation are driving renewable energy to become increasingly cost competitive. And we expect this trend to continue and even accelerate in a future when different schemes we believe, for carbon pricing will increasingly start to reflect the true cost of CO2 emissions. 
So we could choose to see this as a threat to our business, fighting the windmills, to say it like that. That is not a useful approach. We want to act and look upon this as an opportunity. I believe we will see different strategies from our industry. Some companies will choose to remain pure oil and gas producers for as long as possible. Some will take a wait and see approach and then possibly act, while others will gradually transform into broader energy companies. Stadel's approach is to take an active part in shaping this transition, taking our competence and our power of innovation into new areas where we can make a difference through synergies and create long-term value for our shareholders. Our business area called New Energy Solutions is responsible for our strategy for low carbon energy. The starting point is our well-established business in offshore wind. And our current projects puts us on track to deliver electricity to approximately 5 million European homes. In Scotland, we are and will build the world's first floating wind farm a technology that will open up deeper waters where fixed bottom installations are not an option and where we hopefully also will see better wind conditions and resources. This technology is uh, combined with a brand new battery solution to optimize the system all the way from the turbine to the grid. And as we scale up this technology, it will also fit very well together with natural gas as a flexible backup. For Stadol, renewable energy complements our portfolio in a good way, both from an industrial and from a strategic point of view, using our competence and our competitive strength, but also from a financial and from a portfolio perspective. Not only can renewables offer competitive risk-reward proposition, they also add longevity to our portfolio and offer increased resilience against the cyclical nature of our upstream oil and gas business. Turning to my third point, collaboration. Climate change is a much bigger challenge than any company or country can tackle alone. As Secretary John Kerry said, this will be the largest public-private partnership the world has ever attempted. Politicians must design effective policies, including an effective price tag on carbon emissions that give consumers and business incentives, real incentives, to change. And industry must support these efforts through initiatives such as the World Bank's Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. Together we can join forces in partnerships like the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. And hosted by the United Nations Environment Programme, this coalition brings together governments, businesses and NGOs. The oil and gas Methane Partnership is one of the activities under this umbrella. Cutting methane emissions is one of the most effective short-term climate measures available to us. And it's key to ensuring that gas is seen, recognized as a credible part of the low-carbon future. Carbon capture and storage and usage is another area that needs much more attention. It has to be one part of the solution. As an illustration, the Norwegian government and industry are now working together to establish a CCS 
value chain where CO2 from land-based industries in Norway is transported and then stored offshore. And this is only achievable by working together all the way from capture to storage. We also need increased collaboration within the industry. Together with GE, we have teamed up on what we call powering collaboration, using open innovation challenges for a more sustainable oil and gas value chain. And finally, we are working with the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, the OGCI, where 10 companies representing more than 20% of global oil and gas production have committed to accelerating practical climate solutions. To sum it up, these are truly exciting times to be part of the energy industry. The future of energy will be low carbon and our industry must play a central role in achieving that future. Tomorrow's leaders are young people today. How do we make sure that our industry remains attractive to the next generation? Let's make sure that we show them an industry ready for tomorrow's challenges, an industry where we explore new opportunities, and an industry they are inspired to join. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, yeah, wait, please. Yes, I'm, I'll start off by asking a few questions and then we can open it up to the floor. Um, the first question is, well, obviously, if you've been saying renewables is a big, bigger part of your portfolio, it's a one leg of your business strategy, um, and you started your new uh, energy solutions division last May, May last year. At, at the same time, some companies were rowing back on renewables. I mean, but you, every company is facing the same challenges, the same climate challenges. Why do you think there is this difference in strategy? Well, I always take a lot of care if I start commenting on other companies' uh, motives and, and actions. So I, I'll be very cautious there. They have different, you know, histories and different portfolios and different competitive strengths. So, so the, the, the starting point is very different. Uh, so for us, this is, you know, this, the whole thing starts with this fundamental acknowledgement that climate change is real, is really happening. Uh, future will have to be low carbon. That means that the energy system will have to transform. It is transforming. It is going on. Uh, and we want to be part of it. We don't want to watch this from the outside. We want to be part of actually shaping that future. And then the oil and gas industry, there's also a transition going on in the oil and gas industry. The future is going to look different from, from the past. And I think the competitive environment and the fight for margins is going to be tougher than we have ever seen going forward. So to us, this is the new energy solutions and that business area is really about a good, solid business proposition. It's a solid you know, risk reward proposition for our shareholders. That is the starting point. It's a business. They're set up to make money. Uh, I see a lot of synergies with our current oil and gas business. And I could talk a lot about that. And they go both ways, actually. Um, there are financial synergies that I talked about for us from a portfolio perspective to strengthen our portfolio through increased resilience and uh, you know, longevity is, is, is attractive. And then I would also say uh, it is also, you know, the, we're talking about not only renewables but new energy solutions. That means also solutions that in, is enhancing the, the value of oil and gas in, in, in the future energy pictures like CCS, CCU, usage of, of carbon, natural gas renewables, uh, sourcing our facilities with more, more cost and carbon efficient uh, uh, electricity and so on. There are many examples of that. So it's very complementary and a strong financial proposition for us. Right. And this is another question, sort of on the same subject. Um, to me, it seems there's sort of transatlantic divide has opened up. 
um, with the companies like you and Total seemingly embracing renewables or at least that that whole idea setting up special divisions incorporating renewables whereas in the US um, it seems that companies may be still more focused on traditional fossil fuels or is my reading of this transatlantic divide too simplistic well it is oh, okay. right. uh, I really <laughs> want to I've heard that many you know this this very simplistic divide, you know, using the Atlantic as some kind of uh, m magic divide. I think that is that's overly simplistic. I think uh, fundamentally, you see great diversity both in the U.S. among the U.S. companies and 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 among the Europeans and other ISCs. So I think it's far too simplistic. Again, going back to my starting point, I've been very cautious to to comment on specific companies, but but there are different starting points and 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 uh, and uh, responses to it. But I'm sure that whatever is the response, I'm sure these issues is being discussed in every boardroom among the IOCs, uh, seriously. And, and then the, the responses are, are, are different. So, and then we should also remember that, referring to my speech, oil and gas is going to play a significant role in the future combined with renewables. And if you look at by 2040, there, will, there is a need for much more new oil and gas than renewables in energy terms. And we must never forget that. There is a huge role to play for oil and gas companies and also for companies who choose to be pure oil and gas companies. That is okay, but they need to do it in a sustainable way. Then you have gas players that focus more on natural gas. That is also good, good for climate. So we have chosen another route you know, to, to, you know, to really start changing and you know, turning around our business model, including renewable energy and, and low carbon energy. And, uh, Going back to my starting point, I think this is the best proposition for us to be part of it, understand what is going on, and that makes it, gives us a better hand and a better position to make choices, business choices also mm -hmm. in the future, than we will be able to if we stand at the sideline. Right. Um, actually, I did want to ask you a question about gas. I mean, I think uh, you just said it was a credible part of the low carbon future. And you, among you know, one of a number of companies who are touting gas as the ideal partner for renewables in a decarbonising world. Um, but it, if gas is to do well, it has to be competitive against coal. And one of the problems seems to be it's not in Asia. And I know, again, Statoil is among a number of European companies that has been ca calling for a robust international carbon price. But in the absence of government policy, to introduce a robust carbon price, what do you think the industry itself should be doing to promote gas? Well, going back to my starting, I have to do that, to do the storyline. There's no way the world is going to achieve the climate ambitions without addressing coal forcefully. So whether they see it or don't see it now, they will have to see it at one point that coal has to be displaced. And there's only, I see only natural gas that can do that with the speed and with the scale that is actually needed complemented obviously by renewable energy. So this has to be solved. And then there are basically three ways of addressing this. It's through directly addressing coal through you know, performance standards and things like that. That is effective, but it might not necessarily be cost effective mm -hmm. way of doing it. Then you have carbon pricing, which I think our industry should, and I do, and we do, many of us do, advocate carbon pricing strongly. I think that is the only you know, fundamental approach to really addressing this in a way where sort of the market and industrial players take action on a rational basis. And then it's, it's about the cost of natural gas. That, you know, has to be competitive. Cost has come down and the price of natural gas has come down. We have seen a lot of investment into new gas infrastructure that has basically, you know, taken away the borderlines between the regional markets of the world or is doing that. So I think we have come a long way in actually creating a system of arbitrage and trading uh, that is creating a, you know, consistency among the regions of the world. Uh, there's a lot of new capacity coming in. Every player is really working hard to reduce upstream costs. So I think the industry is doing a lot and have to continue to do what it, you know, what it takes to, to, to make sure that cost is real, uh, or the, the natural gas is competitive also in the, in the longer term. Okay, thank you. Well, one last question from me before I open it up to the floor. In the incredibly unlikely event, we're both sitting here 10 years from now, how do you think you'd be describing Statoil to me, still as basically a fossil fuel producer with a renewables leg or more a renewables producer with a fossil fuel leg? 
Oh, that's the trick. That's a huge tr <laughs> I, mean, I never give a percentage. I never sort of you place me 10 years ahead. I, I, I think uh, we have definitely produced more oil and gas than, than, than renewables, and quite a lot so. So this is a slow moving thing, you know, for our renewables business is huge industrial enterprises to establish a wind farm offshore somewhere is a huge, is a big industrial project with long timelines. And we need to find them, we need to make them competitive, develop them, construct them and produce them. So this is, you know, this is going to take time, but I am convinced that our, oil, our renewables business and low carbon business will increase at a faster pace than our oil and gas business. That's as far right. as I can okay. go for now. Okay, well, can I open it up to questions from the floor, please? David Knapp, Energy Intelligence Group. Thank you very much uh, for your discussion. I'll get over here where you can that see me. You. Yeah, exactly. Um, carbon uh, capture and sequestration. There has been some work uh, by Statoil around the uh, Sleipner, and the uh, Utsara uh, hasn't been very cooperative, I guess although it's not clear to me that the leaks were in places that really affected the project they were talking about. Are you working on that as well so that you can continue uh, operating the oil and gas part of the business and still be satisfying uh, some of the requirements about, uh, about the CO2 portion, if not the methane portion? Thank you. I think our, our part of the CCS value chain is mainly related to the storage. We are, we are long on storage and storage competence and, and the reservoirs. That's where we have our main emissions. And, and when it comes to Sleipner, that is a very good you know, showcase for what we can do. It fits nicely into the Sleipner context. We are also doing that at, uh, at Snövit, the LNG project in the far north. So we're returning uh, carbon to the reservoir. Uh, but I think the biggest contribution and, and into a future business model for us is uh, to deal with storage and take part of that, you know, that final end of the, of, the, of, the, of the solution. And I will also add usage of CO2. I think there is you know, potential there which is, uh, hasn't been exploded when it comes to oil recovery and, and also other usage like fracking and so on. Thanks. Hi, Elder. It's Lydia from Barclays here. Just coming back to the point about carbon pricing and the need for that, how do you actually see that developing? Is it going to be a country by country approach, do you think? Is it going to be you're going to have to have something from the World Bank globally? And how quickly do you think that can get into place? Yeah, so I realize, fully realize the complexity of, of this theme. I also realize the necessity of addressing it. So there are other, the other routes are even more complex, I believe, than actually embarking on this. I think there, will, there are many countries, I don't know how many, around 40 countries, that is actually embarking on different types of schemes, from taxes to trading schemes. Europe is firm, Norway is firm on this, uh, and we see many other countries, China and so on, Canada. So I think what needs to be done is to establish some principles that these various systems can, can be work, worked around, so they can be connected to each other. So I think that is the starting point. And then, I, I, I'm not naive, I don't think it's possible to establish sort of one global scheme, overarching scheme, at least for a long, long time. But principles so that various national schemes and sort of regional schemes can be combined and start working together and exchange quotas. I think that is the, the, the first ambition that we should target. Um, hi, Jonathan Lelouch from King Street Capital. Um, some of the other panelists discussed earlier oil demand growth expected to be, you know, 1 to 1.2 million barrels a day over the next few years. If you take a long-term view, say 10-year view on oil demand, um, how much would you expect renewable energy sources as well as low-carbon energy um, to effectively knock down the oil demand over that period? I mean, the demand destruction effectively and replacement um, shifting, from, shifting from oil to uh, renewable and, and, and cleaner energy sources. So I think there is a lot of forces, and we have seen that in our part of the world, in the Western part, in the US, Europe, that actually oil demand is already shrinking, right? And, uh, and that is coming from, from many, many drivers, mainly you know, uh, energy efficiency, car efficiency, uh, 
but increasingly, I think we'll see that also in 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 into uh, uh, you know road transportation and so on. And and I think the, the biggest impact then you know will be on light duty vehicles, where electrification uh, you know uh, you know hybrids and, and and electric vehicles. I had spent two weeks in uh, one week in. In, in Silicon Valley, a few you know, a couple of weeks ago, and there's a lot of fascinating things going on. I think the speed of that, you know, will surprise us. Uh, when it comes to more heavy-duty vehicles, it's more complex, and other forms of transportation, it will take longer time. So overall, this is a transition. It will take a long time, and if you, if you, but if you go into the 20s, you know, at some point during the 20s, I think we will get into a position where we'll see a, a global peak, you know, when it comes to, to oil demand. Then we are into shrinking oil industry. Hi, my name is Peter. I'm from uh, Brussels Atlas Invest. Um, I think Norway is uh, an example of how a country can use revenues from oil, oil and money, and to build a great renewable energy platform. Uh, how do you think this this can be? How can you, how can countries make sure that th these kind of revenues are invested in the right place to build these kind of platforms with oil revenues? Mm. Well, I think, you know, in, in Norway, we are very fortunate. We have a clean hydro-based, you know, power generation. So we, we basically export energy, clean energy from, 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 from hydro power generation. When it comes to the oil and gas industry, uh, you know, we are, the emissions from our industry is around half, you know, the global average uh, in the production process. I think one of the main drivers for that is that we have had a price on carbon for, for, for decades now on the Norwegian continent shelf. And we have shown and we've seen that it actually works and that it impacts the way we produce oil and gas. So I think that is the best you know, policy component with the biggest impact that I also talked about from, from a more global perspective. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Very good, I enjoyed it very much. And I thank you everybody here. Thank you. Thank you.